Running Aces Casino and Racetrack is the Twin Cities' premier choice for exciting entertainment. 24-7 gaming and dining, monthly comedy shows, and $1 blackjack with no commission or ante, making it the most player-friendly casino around. Trout Air Tavern at Running Aces offers Minnesota-inspired handcrafted dishes with locally sourced ingredients and the trout that made the area famous. Running Aces Casino and Racetrack, 25 minutes north of downtown. Visit runaces.com. Running Aces, your night out is waiting. Talking about Drew Brees and also Kirk Cousins' performance from uh, the other day. So let's start, Courtney, though, with how the Vikings beat the Eagles and how much praise they deserve for that win and whether we feel like the season is back on track. And we want to hear from you. You can always chime in with us, 651 651- Six four six eight two five five because every time a team loses in the NFL, they are the worst team ever, and everyone should be fired, cut, or traded, and they should have drafted everyone else the year before. And every time they win, they were geniuses of the draft. The coach needs a raise or coach of the year, and the quarterback is the greatest player in the league. That's just how it is felt with this team going from week to week so far. And, and it's the, the cliche, week-to-week week league, but that has been very much in play with the Minnesota Vikings. It has. And from the general 30,000-foot sense of the entire league, the reason for that is you have 16 games. We don't talk about that in any other sport, and I think that that's something that's unique and preserved and will continue to be preserved in the NFL because there's so few games and you don't really like you know when you cover the NBA, you cover the NHL, you you kind of establish constant themes for this week or you know this stretch of the season. Mm-hmm. This was a story, and then it transitioned into something else. A week ago at this time, the sky was falling. Even though Doug Peterson, to his credit, said it wasn't, and Mike Zimmer said this is not a time for woe is me. Now the Vikings coming off a pretty big, sizable win to in many cases, get everything back on track, it's a complete, the paradigm has shifted completely the opposite direction. So, uh, you know, when you talk about the NFL being a week-to-week league, and particularly as it pertains to the Vikings, it's hard because how do you diagnose? I think that that's something that people struggle with, diagnosing where the issues are. If it's something that is kind of, you know, popping up here, popping up there, if it's not a continual issue, like, for the example, the offensive line. We know that's going to be something we talk about, good, bad, win, or loss. But the play of the defense, you know, are they all of a sudden now back on track because they were able to sack Carson Wentz three times? I don't know. I don't think that's – I think it's too early to tell. So there's a couple ways we can try to figure this out. Is like like you're saying, which – things are repeatable now going forward which things are concerns going forward still even though you won and when i look at, at that game i say yeah the defense did sack carson wentz and mike zimmer some of those zone dog blitzes that he uses they got home and hit him uh, harrison smith mackenzie alexander both successfully blitzed in that game and they made Carson Wentz look a lot less like the version of last year because of how they were able to pressure him. That's where everything starts with the Zimmer defense. And if you're going to succeed long term, starting with this week against Arizona, you're going to have to pressure Josh Rosen. That is something we didn't see as much between week one and then the game against Philadelphia. I think that they can continue to do that. The problem, though, is letting Philadelphia back in that game, giving up some of the big pass plays. Once again, we saw a team have, in the second half, especially with the Eagles, but even in the first half, they moved the ball. We saw an offense moving the ball and creating some big plays against the Vikings in that game, and they nearly gave it away because of that. And so I don't feel like we can walk away from the Philadelphia win saying, okay, defense fixed, Stephen Weatherly actually good, which he probably is, but I don't think that that means that the defense is fixed. It probably just was never as bad as it looked in Los Angeles. This is the problem I have when, as a writer, as someone who goes to games to analyze, to to do my job, that when there's wins like this, yes, wins are wins in the NFL, good, bad, ugly, however you get them because you have so few opportunities. Um and and the strength of competi- strength of schedule, strength of competition, who you face, it makes it very difficult. I don't ever, f- unless it's honestly a blowout, you can't ever really feel that great as a writer and an analyzing, just sugar- putting all the sugar out there without being like, well, this happened, mm-hmm. and pointing out the negative plays. And I don't know if fans really understand and appreciate 
just what it takes to go into that. And I'll pull a perfect example. I got destroyed last year after that Rams game. Yes, they shut out the the most impressive, prolific offense. And, you know, after that one touchdown drive, they weren't able to score again. I remember specifically my analysis was Case Keenum's going to get this team killed mm-hmm. if he makes throws like that to Adam Thielen. I mean, he's lucky That's as right. hell that he has Thielen as his receiver. But there were multiple times in that game that I'm sure Mike Zimmer was cringing at watching how Case Keenum hand. I mean, escaping pressure, escaping out of the pocket pressure. That's great and dandy, but some of the throws he made would eventually come down the line to cost them. And I think, Manny, that that to me was, that's what my analysis was. You guess it's a great win. You have a lot of things to hang your hat on there, specifically with the defense. But these are signs for the offense that are going to be a problem down the line to come. And I think you know, carrying that over into this year, we kind of are seeing the same thing here. Yes, you can get a win, and it's big, and it's a momentum shift, but there are a lot of holes in that. And I think that that's yeah. something within teams that... If you if you're if you're really doing your job, if you're covering it, you're looking at it from all angles, and and those are the blemishes that stand out. Well, even look at what our thought was at the start of the season, forecasting the first five games of the season, mm-hmm. and, and seeing the Eagles on the schedule, and thinking, oh man, you know they got to take care of business against the 49ers and the Bills at home because you know they're going to be at the Rams and they're going to be at the Eagles in back to back weeks, and boy, the Eagles game is going to be tough. And now here we are a couple of days after the Eagles game, and we're, we're asking what the hell's wrong with the Eagles because the Eagles don't even look like <laughs> the same team that they were a year ago because of injuries and, and other things. And I think that the Super Bowl hangover as another NFL cliche that we mm-hmm. talk about, I think it's very yep. real with this team. Yep. Carson Wentz is not moving the same way that he did a year ago. Granted, his ACL injury was a much more complex one than you see for Dalvin Cook and other you know other players who have had the same injury. Um they're now down running back. The, the the offensive line did not look the same as it did in that NFC Championship game. So that's yep. that's that's like I guess just the constant theme that we see with them right now, which is probably not to be not expected for a double negative there. But they're two two and one. Did everybody within this five foot range of me not think that they would be two and three? After week five, yes. I mean, that's the thing that's a little weird. Yeah. Probably just because of the way that they, the way that their wins and losses have and tie has stacked up. That nobody predicted a tie. Nobody predicted predicted that they would lose to the Bills, which is why I think right. this feels a little bit more desperate and a little bit more weird because we knew above all else, the first five weeks of this season were going to be incredibly difficult for them, especially with a new quarterback and a new offense to to eclipse a better record than two and three. So we kind of have a micro and macro sort of conversation here because the on the macro, on the, on the bigger picture side, you have two, two, and one as the Vikings record after five games, five games that we knew would be very difficult for them. The, and, and if you just look at it in that way and where the NFC North stands, that nobody is super convincing in the NFC North, even Chicago, who looks like the best team, but as far away from proving anything to anyone, especially with Mitch Trubisky, I'm still, even after a big game against the Bucks, not entirely sold on him. The Green Bay Packers have lost games that maybe they shouldn't or tied a game that they should have won. Uh, if you're in Green Bay, you feel like you should have beaten Minnesota. You feel like you should have beaten Detroit. Detroit's got a couple of very good wins. They also have some bad losses. And so everything is a mess there. And if you said back at the beginning of the season, okay, you're going to be 2-2-1 two, two and one, and everything's just going to be a cluster and there will be no real conclusions to be drawn after five weeks in the NFC North, I think we all would have said, yeah, okay, that's not, that sounds about right. I didn't expect a tie, but that sounds about right. But then if you add in, oh yeah, they scored six points against Buffalo, be like, oh, what now? Uh, and, and just winning against Philadelphia does not wash away what happened against the Rams, and it does not wash away what happened against the Bills, because this team showed us against Buffalo that it's capable of an extremely disappointing and shocking loss, which last year we just did not see. And and I wouldn't call the NFC Championship game a disappointing and shocking loss because... I mean, it's the NFC Championship game. You're playing the team that won the Super Bowl. So it's not the same as losing the Buffalo when you're favored by two touchdowns or that, whatever it was. Well, that, you had the number one defense. Nobody expected them to get shredded that way. Yeah, that was yeah. shocking. By the backup quarterback. That Bills loss is never going to go away, is it? No. That's going to that's gonna linger and linger. Even if they make the playoffs, I feel like there's going to be so many of us saying, well, gosh, they 
probably have a better seed if they hadn't, you know, if they hadn't lost that game at home to the Buffalo Bills, even if they finish 11-4-1 or whatever it might be. So my question, and you are listening to Purple Live, Matthew Collar, ESPN's Courtney Cronin, Manny Hill as well, and that is my question. You led me perfectly into it, is where do you feel like this is all going to go for the Vikings now? After you've seen the best and worst, basically. You've seen the offense be great at times. You saw the defense look much more like themselves last week against Philadelphia. You got the win that you so desperately needed. They needed to split with the Rams in Philadelphia. So now, where do we feel like this team will finish? Give us a call. 651 646 Eight two five five. Do you still think that they should be a division champion? Are you much less confident about that, or are you not really sold at all? Are they going to have to do a lot more to sell you on that? So let's look at the upcoming game here against Arizona and the schedule going forward. Kind of this next quarter where they can really put themselves apart. There's a, an opportunity, but there's also one game in there that will be very much a prove-it game. So let's talk about that when we come back. Purple Live here on 1500 ESPN. Hey, it's Darren Doogie Wolfson here from 5 Eyewitness News, and I contribute to 1500 ESPN. The goal is to always have more scoops than Raisin Bran. I pride myself on being up to date on what's happening with the Wolves, Wild, Twins, Vikings, Go for Sports, the Lynx, United, and everything else going on in this busy sports marketplace. Check out the Scoop Podcast. You can find the Scoop on Apple Podcasts, Podcast One, or wherever you happen to get your podcast. Everson Griffin out and Stephen Weatherly in his place, but I was thinking like maybe where is uh Ryan Robeson? Maybe we can bring him back or switch things up with like Tom Johnson and then Sheldon Richardson at the end. Hey Sean, appreciate the call. You know, I think uh Stephen Weatherly played his best game and obviously caused that Linval Joseph the the fumble for the touchdown. And the way that I look at it now is you're probably not going to see changes there. That with Weatherly coming along the way he has, and it is a big difference still between he and Everson Griffin. As Didn't it he caused the uh, he caused the Ajayi fumble too down the near the goal line? I think that was no. Eric they they credited Kendricks, Kendricks with yeah. that one. Okay, did yeah. they? Okay, for, for actually the fumble and the recovery, I believe. Yeah, yeah I know he got the recovery. But uh, I mean, okay. of course, I mean you're all there in a very tight space at the you know with what the one or four, four, two yard line. So mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure he had some play in it. To to the point about B Rob, I, I thought of the same thing when. The, everything went down with Everson Griffin, but it just seems like they made their call there and they're going to stick with it. And the fact that they decided to sign Jonathan Wynn off the practice squad to put him on the defensive line uh, when Tashawn Bauer was hurt, I, I think that that tells you that they're not going to bring B Rob back, that they just didn't feel like he still had it. And if they could still play the way that they did on Sunday, it's going to make up for some of the issues that they have in the secondary still. And you think about, there was still communication problems, Courtney. I mean, there was at the goal line, Smallwood drops a ball that would have been a first down and probably turns into a touchdown for the Eagles, where the Vikings secondary cannot figure out who's supposed to line up where. That is stuff that we haven't seen a whole lot of in the last few years. The two-point conversion, same thing. I mean, Andrew Sandejo, for a large part, is kind of, gotten, I guess, I mean, really kind of skated by in terms of getting the blame for a lot of the miscommunication issues, but I think it's starting to become more apparent that a lot of this is on the back end. I mean, it has been. I mean, we've talked about the miscommunication issues between, like, the the linebackers and then the Nichols, and, and Mike Zimmer said after Los Angeles, he doesn't think it's cornerbacks, hmm. especially the Nichols, uh, yeah. which I don't really understand, because Mackenzie Alexander has not been good. I don't want to I don't want to turn this into, like, a trash Andrew Sandejo segment or anything, but does he even know how to tackle? I think he's struggling with it, to be quite honest. I think that, and watching his body language post-game in the locker room, you and I were there. I mean, he was in his locker for quite a long time on his phone, which I would, you know, probably watching, probably someone sent him that play. I mean, he's... He has a reputation. Mike Zimmer was asked about this yesterday, and I think it's a very good point that Referees watch film too. Mm-hmm. They he's got a target on his back. I mean, Mike went out on a limb, unprompted, to tell the story about what happened in Green Bay when the ref basically said he was mandated to throw the flag on Sendejo. And I think that as a and that's de- why we had that call at the end of the game the other day where he got called for that helm, even though it probably was a bad call. It was but a it's very like, bad call on, on second watch. But it's like this is the reputation that he's 
developed over the last five years by trying to spear people instead of actually tackling people. And, and I think that, you know, kind of playing, you know, devil's advocate here, it's it's really hurt him this year because he's not playing with the same edge and he looks, you know, he looks, I don't know if the word skittish is the right word, but he looks, you know, hesitant in a lot of situations and whether that's, you know, just from the tackling perspective, but also, you know, try, coverage too. And overall, the secondary, whether Mike Zimmer wants to point the blame at some of the corners or not, it has not been anywhere close to the same. And I looked to see what Mackenzie Alexander's numbers are now, and it's 14 passes in his direction for 14 completions. Exactly. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and, and even though Mike Hughes played well, he still gives up a big pass. And, and here's a guy, though, that we haven't talked about at all that we have just kind of sat and waited to see where this goes. But Xavier Rhodes has not played very well so far to start the season. I mean, now you're five weeks in, and he's giving up a lot more success than he has before. And so when we're tying this back into the big conversation, I think you got questions all over the field. I mean, you, you guys are talking about Sendejo. I mean, is one of those penalties going to be super costly at some point that he takes? And it's like a weekly thing now. How's the communication there? Can they figure out what they're going to do with the nickel position? Are we going to see Trey Wayans again soon? There are a lot of questions there that remain. So even though they got the win, you still feel, I think, more, much more confident about the defensive line, but still feel on shaky ground with that secondary. Let's uh, go to Andy here. What's going on, Andy? How you doing? Doing good. Good. Stuck in traffic on Cedar because Manny's telling everybody to stay off of 35W because of the accident. So I appreciate that, Manny. Thank big, you. Yeah, big crash on uh, near the Minnesota River. Yeah, It's, it's rough <laughs> out there. What do you got uh, for us, Andy? So, so I'm just thinking best case scenario for the Vikings. You know, the rest of the year is uh, like a 10-5-1 type record. Mm-hmm. And I just think that's assuming that uh, you get Everson back and uh, you get some things figured out with this defense. I just find it hard to believe with the schedule that they have left that uh, they're going to be able to do better than that. I mean, you still got two games against uh, Detroit, which it seems like we split with pretty much every year. You still got two games left with uh, Chicago with the improved defense. You still got to go to the Patriots. You still got uh, the Saints coming into town, and it's just it's just tough. Not, and that's not even including, obviously, having to play Aaron Rodgers again. So, Andy, I agree with everything you said, and I wish you the best of luck getting home. Hey, thanks a lot. Appreciate the call, Andy. Uh, Courtney, give us the latest on Everson Griffin. Well, what Adam Schefter reported the other day is that it doesn't appear to be anytime soon uh, that we're going to get some sort of timetable just to begin with. And that is not surprising when you think of what we're talking about here is a mental health issue. Mm-hmm. Um that, you know, it could be, I think one of the quotes in there was that it could be next week. It could be never again. And the ambiguity is something that the Vikings from a game plan, when you're taking, just when you're just looking at football, they have to basically plan like he's not going to be there. Mm-hmm. Because that's why that's why you have to go all in with Stephen Weatherly. And as Mike Zimmer said, he's playing like he belongs now. He's not playing like he's looking over his shoulder. Um, and I think that this is an important time for him to really come into his own. But from the perspective of, what Everson Griffin, you know, is doing right now and what he's going back to when he's going to be focusing on football again, I just don't think it's even a conversation. I think that they have really gone about this in an indefinite mindset saying, okay, take as long as you need because I, I don't think they want to risk bringing him back too early or have or really having him come back too early where he's just not in a good place. And and that's it's such a hard thing to talk about. I'm even struggling about trying to figure out the right words to use here because – it's a contact sport, and if you're taking hits to the head when, you know, and not saying that that has that not, not at all saying that that had anything to do with some of the issues that he's facing, but it just doesn't seem like it's maybe the right place um, when he's going, when he's so vulnerable in other areas, and, and I just think that they are really trying to take the football aspect out and say, just take care of yourself, do whatever you need to do. So part two to Andy's call was 10-5-1 and one being the ceiling, and even with it... That was the floor are, for us when we predicted it, remember? We... Was that what do you mean after the like the first week? No, the tie, I mean our, or after they tied, or do you mean just ten like and six? Ten and six, ten okay, and six yeah, was ten our and six. for for yep. forever. You and I have been talking about ten and six, and it's it's hard now because you take a look at the schedule to think that I agree with Andy. I think that that's where you should be looking at, and that's still potentially a playoff team. 
The ceiling, if the, the if the tie doesn't come in to screw them over at some point, and the ceiling will be hard to reach. It won't be easy. I mean, because even the Jets are occasionally dangerous with Sam Darnold. That it seems like he can have a hot day and light you up with a few big plays. New Orleans is going to be really tough, even though they're coming here. I agree with splitting in Chicago because Soldier Field just always has this uh, hex Mm -hmm. on the Vikings, right? Tough place to play. And you still have to face Brady, Russell Wilson. How about the way he played against the Rams? Unbelievable game from him. So he's still dangerous. And then I'm not sure what Detroit really is. I mean, to me, I'm I'm looking at the most realistic is probably 9-6-1. And and then the ceiling is probably, like Andy said, only 10-5-1. That's probably the best that they could do. And if they did that, they should be like over the moon because that means that they fixed some of the defensive issues that they've had. Yeah. I mean, the crux of this whole thing that I just, you know, to bring it back to your original point of the NFL being a week to week league, I don't think for them to get to where they're at right now at two, two, and one. Did anybody really think the defense was going to be the issue? They were going to have a regression like this? No. Nope. Everybody thought that, okay, you got Dalvin Cook. You, you know, you're going to have your explosive run game. It's going to be great. You're going to have your number one defense take pressure off Kirk Cousins, maybe score a few touchdowns here off some turnovers. Great. We thought Kirk Cousins was going to be the problem. And, and problem, I use that, he, that it was going to be a learning curve and that mm-hmm. he was going to take some time to adjust. This whole thing has kind of been flipped upside down and turned inside out because the areas you expected to be kind of your early Achilles, early Achilles heel are not that, and then the ones you didn't expect are what are tripping you up. Let's go to Chris here on Purple Live. What's up, Chris? Hey, guys. Um, I was just wondering what you think with the Vikings kind of getting off to a not great start, but it doesn't really seem like anyone else in the division is pulling out to a big lead. What do you think is the number for this division to get to get that win? Is it 10, or do you think it's going to be a little bit higher with Chicago at 3-1? and one? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. Mm-hmm. Appreciate the call. Um, you know, I, I think that 10 probably does win it because when I look at Chicago, I think that they are a very stacked defense and a talented team, but I am not sold on Mitch Trubisky being the true answer or a guy who's ready to lead a team that's winning a division and a Super Bowl. I think he's going to have to do a lot more than beat the Tampa Bay Bucks by 38 to prove that to me. And with all these teams beating up on each other, would any of us be surprised if there were splits across the board, except for maybe we'll get another tie against Green Bay and then it's like, <laughs> then it's split. But, Does it negate but, itself at that point? But, but if even if they, I mean, you could you could sell me on win or lose to Green Bay when they come here and then split with the other two teams. So that means they're basically beating up on each other and everybody in this division has a tough schedule this year. No one was talking about how the NFC North could inevitably cannibalize itself when we saw all of these incredible moves happening in the draft when the Bears go out and are really in the offseason too when they go out and get a ton of different receivers and the Lions get you know they fix their offensive line and they fix their run game and the Vikings do what they do and the Packers do what they do um, it seems like we're putting out fires by starting other ones and that's a problem where I do agree with is it Mike who just called in Chris Chris Chris, Chris sorry mm-hmm. um, I just, agree just pick a white guy name <laughs> I think 10 wins is probably what you're going to have to get to because of what the schedule is going to turn out for so many other teams where you're probably going to be fighting till like week 17 to get there too. I don't think this thing's going to be decided right. any sooner than the end of the season. Purple Live. It is the live version of the Purple Podcast. We appreciate the calls coming in. Matthew Collar along with ESPN's Courtney Cronin, Manny Hill here as well. And to join us next, national NFL writer and an author of a book that I'm just starting to dive into, The Genius of desperation it is super football so if you are all about learning about the history of the league and understanding the game better this is going to be perfect for you so doug will talk with us next about how defenses can adjust to slow down some of this incredible offense that is happening now in the nfl Lucky's 13 Pubs has you covered for the best game day experience this football season. Tons of TVs, legendary appetizers, amazing fresh half-pound burgers, handcrafted sandwiches, and a wide variety of other pub favorites. The drink menu is awesome, too. Huge selection of tap beer, handcrafted cocktails, and the best Bloody Marys in town. Seriously, these Bloodies are awesome. Try the Bacon Bloody, the Jalapeno Bloody, the Mother Mary, or just get a flight and try them all. Plus, Lucky's 13 celebrates Sunday Fun Day, happy hour all day long 
along on Sunday, every Sunday. Events and prize giveaways during games, too. Lucky's 13 has locations in Bloomington, Burnsville, Mendota, Plymouth, and Roseville. Having people over for the game? Call ahead to Lucky's and order some of those legendary apps, and they'll be ready to bring home when you get there. It's football time at Lucky's 13 Pubs. Find them online at Lucky's13Pub.com. Lucky's13Pub.com. It's the most wonderful time of the year, football time. And Lucky's 13 Pubs has you covered for the best game day experience. Lucky's13Pub.com. Of the uh, all of the outlets before I uh, leave this block. <laughs> that, that's right. But now USA Today. You no, know, it changed jobs every three years. It's crazy. That, yeah, that's right. Well, you got to keep it's like, the, tur- it's like turnover in the NFL. That's right. Just constantly exactly. happens. You, see, because if you are Mike Tomlin, you hang around too long, or or Jason Garrett, then it just gets ugly by the end. So you, you are not Marvin Lewis. That is the thing that we want to get out. <laughs> of No, here. I'm not Marvin. Well, they, what they say about the coaches losing their uh, voice in the locker room after a decade, uh, it'll probably never happen to me. Yeah, uh, p- probably not, because there will always be coaches that are losing the voice for you to write about. Uh, now uh, at USA Today, and I want to start out with you, Doug, because I'm just starting to dive into your book, and you got a forward by. Lewis Riddick is one of my favorite guys. And the theme of the genius of desperation is that things change in the NFL all the time. And where we are now is the NFL's offenses dominating defenses. And we've seen the Vikings be the victim of that a few times, especially in Los Angeles two weeks ago. What do you expect from studying historically how this has worked? What do you expect defenses to do to adjust to what's happening on offense so far this year? It's a great question, and I've been doing a lot of uh, radio hits and podcasts for the book over the last couple of weeks, and everyone's asking me that question, and I, I think to myself, well, uh, a lot of the offensive concepts that have taken over the league came from the high school and college levels. The, the RPO moved up from high school in the 90s to college in the 2000s and especially in the 2010s. Uh, I remember Urban Meyer telling XNL Labs in 2014 that the RPO was going to take over college and eventually take over the NFL. Um, I think that's where you've seen a lot of the uh, the, the genesis of the concepts that uh, especially Andy Reid is using, uh, the, you know, the, the fly sweep touchdown pitch, which I think should be a running touchdown. I know it's where you hand the ball off like six inches to a guy, and he runs <laughs> yes. in, and you get a passing touchdown under that. I, you know, I think guys like Kiki Kuti should protest. But in a general sense, when you look at, and I've been talking to a couple of high school coaches for a piece I'm doing um, pretty soon, and it's kind of an expansive piece of how defenses need to catch up to offenses. And the first thing that high school coaches would tell you at this point is that the NFL to them is really boring. Mm -hmm. And one of my high school coaches that I talked to was a graduate assistant at Baylor for a while. So he had seen all the Big 12 defenses play the Big 12 offenses. And he's like, the stuff that even the best NFL defenses are doing, especially in the red zone, is like first-day high school install. Hmm. Like first-day, really rudimentary stuff. And I remember watching uh, when the, was the game-winning touchdown from Andy Dalton to A.J. Green against the Falcons a couple weeks ago. And the Falcons played just soft. It wasn't even two man. It was just base cover two. And they had beaten the Bengals with kind of the same coverage the play before. And then the right outside receiver was Alex Erickson. Now it's A.J. Green. A.J. Green is your boundary receiver, and you don't change the coverage at all. You have a rookie cornerback going face up on him. And they don't change the coverage. You look at Drew Brees' historic throw. I wrote about this today where they go uh, cover two pre-snap, they adjust to cover three, and Josh Norman doesn't hear it, so he's still in cover two. And it's just amazing to me how defenses are, a lot of defenses are still playing like it's 2005. And you can have what's called an execution defense. Mike Zimmer's defense is very much like this, where everyone, he gets the guys who fit what he wants to do. He doesn't, you know, he has the A-gap mug blitzes and things like that. He runs a lot more nickel than most defensive coordinators do. Like, you know, every def- nickel is the new base and all that. But when you talk to high school coaches, and I would imagine Big 12 defensive coordinators, they look at the NFL and they go, why aren't you guys adjusting? And there are things like match coverage, which some teams do. The Cowboys do it a lot. They did it a lot in the red zone, and it's one of the reasons that the Texans were so bad in the red zone. And basically what match coverage is, 
is you start off in zone coverage, and then say you're playing zone against like a 12-yard slant, and the receiver starts the slant eight yards, the moment the receiver takes his break, you switch from zone to man. Hmm. And you're trailing that receiver no matter what. You're not dropping into a zone. You're following a guy, but it looks like zone pre-snap, so when the receiver runs across the, the field, you're not changing everything. And when you talk to high school coaches, they can't believe how easy it is for offenses to diagnose and attack NFL defenses. So I think what's going to have to happen is I think a lot more, I, I think dime helps a lot against, you know, three by one sets and two by twos and all that. But you're going to have to come up with some pattern matching, pattern reading. I go back to the Saints last year where they got demolished the first two games and then Dennis Allen, their defensive coordinator, started doing a lot more pattern match and their defense switched overnight. So I think, I think overall, you need to talk about this or that concept, but defenses are going to have to be more adaptable on their end, but not show it. High school coaches will tell you, we don't change the looks or the rules for anything based on what the offense does. We sort of try and dictate it back to them. Doug, I think you bring up such a good point of where the offensive explosion, at least, it seems to be trending from what's happening, as you said, at the lower levels and, you know, starting in high school and then going to college. The notion that I've always ha- I've always felt with a lot of NFL coaches is that they scoff at what's happening in the Big 12 to the to the Pac-12 to a degree, you know. You think of teams like Texas Tech, Houston, Texas A&M, where I've heard that called seven on seven, and a lot of NFL coaches, even offensive coordinators that you know I've had this conversation with, seem to think that that's gimmicky football to a degree. But can we take a look at what's happening in the NFL right now, where you're seeing the completion Senate completion percentage somewhere around seventy percent, and why quarterback play is as dynamic and as explosive as it is, is kind of that being the root of it, and that people just need to catch on or get lost well true and one of the high school coaches i talked to for this piece said that he thinks part of the reason uh nfl defenses are adaptable is because most defensive coordinators are older guys and they just Hmm. you know they don't so it it may take it may be a generational thing well let's take let's say you're facing the kansas city chiefs well right away you can't play like two man you can't play tight man coverage because the responsibility of a man cornerback is to turn his back to the quarterback and cover the receiver. The moment you turn your back to Patrick Mahomes, you know what's going to happen? Ask the Green Bay Packers when he did it against Colin Kaepernick a few years back, and he runs for 180 yards. The moment that cornerback turns his head, that quarterback has a cow pasture to run through. So you can't do that. So you have to play zone. If you play base cover three, uh, and the Chiefs are running, they're motioning two and three receivers across the field, pre-snap, well, how do you do that? Now, if you go back to what the Broncos did in the first half of that, the one really close game Mahomes has had, they did match. They did match coverage. They, you know, they played aggressive zone, but they had their linebackers and their safeties and their slot defenders matching the underneath receivers. They forced Mahomes past his first read. And as dynamic as Mahomes is and as great as I think he will be over his NFL career, he relies a lot on first read open. And Andy Reid and his staff scheme it that way. So if you have a cover three against a defense like that, against an offense like the Chiefs or the Rams, and you don't have like top level all pro players at every single position, you're going to get, I mean, you're just going to get skated. That's the way it is. And we're at a point now in the NFL where offenses have figured out the base coverages that were in place even five years ago. So defenses are going to have to change or this will continue. So, Doug, what what do you think of Mike Zimmer's capability to do this? Because I remember reading your work uh, years ago when he was the defensive coordinator for the Cincinnati Bengals and you were advocating for him to be a head coach at some point and for a guy that's had different starting quarterbacks every year. which It's amazing that he's won as many games as he has, but now I think he's facing the biggest challenge that he's ever had along the way uh, from a defensive standpoint of all the adjustments and all the talent that exists uh, in the NFL on the offensive side, and he is one of those older guys, but I feel like if there's any coach that does have the ability to tweak it on defense, that it could be him. 
it's happening to, you know, it's happening to Pete Carroll up here in Seattle where I live. Um, it's happening to Wade Phillips. It's happening to all these guys. I mean, Gus Bradley in San Diego, he's going to have to face Mahomes twice a year as long as he has that job. So <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, as far as Zimmer, I wrote a piece a couple weeks ago about why the Vikings defense kind of fell apart, and it looked better against Philadelphia, although Philadelphia has a bit of a broken offense right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think there was – and it's funny because I talk about adapting and, you know, taking it to the offense. I, I almost think the Vikings were a bit too aggressive at certain times. I know they're blitzing Harrison Smith a lot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you have Anthony Barr covering 25-yard seam routes and maybe the best deep safety in the NFL now that Earl Thomas is, for, is blitzing a lot, I'm thinking, well, gosh, that's an interesting strategy. Um, you know, I think I think he's been experimenting with some moving parts. Um, I know he was talking to his defense this week, this last week, trying to, you know, what do you think is wrong and, you know, how do we fix it? Which is, you know, that's that's why Zimmer's a good coach, is he's going to look beyond himself and say, okay, maybe I'm doing this wrong. You know, and, and he he knows he's forgotten more about defense than, than most of us know about, but as you said, he's facing that same challenge that every defense in the NFL is right now, which is how do you play old rules in a new world? And that's really what he, you know, that's what's happening now. Another issue that's facing the Vikings, and I know it's a lot of other teams, or that is the concept of can you be one dimensional? essentially, on offense. And this is something that, you know, throughout the first four, five weeks, they really haven't run the ball well at all due to injuries to Dalvin Cook and obviously due to the state of the offensive line that doesn't appear to be getting better. Um, is there a way that this can continue to work for the Vikings? Because I know Mike Zimmer talked about it yesterday that, you know, the, the at least from the reason that he kind of sees this happening is because there are a lot of defenses in single high and that, you know, uh, what teams are going to throw a, a six-yard screen instead of go for the two-yard run. With with the offensive explosion that we've seen really at the hand of Kirk Cousins, can you see a a scenario where they can continue this without the help of the run game at all, especially though if they can get their defense back to where they have some support on the other end so Cousins doesn't have to do it alone? Well, I think the first time I saw two teams in the Super Bowl that really did not have good running attacks, it was the Steelers and the Cardinals at the end of the 2008 season in Super Bowl Forty Three. Uh, if I remember correctly, by Football Outsiders uh, offensive line metrics, Arizona and Pittsburgh are the two worst offensive lines in the NFL. Hmm. Neither one of them, neither one of those teams, ran the ball really well. And with Pittsburgh, it was focus on defense and go for the shot play. Um, Arizona had a decent defense, but what they really did is they kind of did what Bill Walsh did in a different way: it was Kurt Warner three and five step drop, get the ball out quickly, yards after catch. It was very much a Bill Walsh philosophy. So both of those teams made the Super Bowl. It was one of the greatest Super Bowls of all time. But the point is, you can win the Super Bowl without a run game. I mean, the Packers did it a few years ago. Um, You can be highly competitive without a run game. What you need is a fully dimensional passing game. And I think you need to scheme week to week against different opponents and different defenses. And your own defense has to be able to get the other team off the field because if you're passing all the time it generally not all the time it generally stands to reason that you're going to not you know you're going to not chew up enough clock um unless you have a really high completion percentage so you have to take that into account but i don't automatically assume that because you don't have a top 10 run game you can't be competitive just like the uh, 94 New England Patriots, right, Doug? They stopped running altogether and just threw checkdowns all the time. And I think Drew Brees, or uh, Drew uh, Bledsoe ended up with this, almost 700 passes in 1994, which was yep. rather unusual. He threw unusual. 70 passes in a, in 70, a comeback yes, win, in a comeback <laughs> overtime win against the Vikings. I'll never forget it. The Vikings blew a 20 Well, you guys lead. beat Detroit twice a year, right? Yes. I and mean, they're still trying to figure that out. Yes, that's true. <laughs> uh, Doug, great stuff. Why don't you tell everyone about your book, The Genius of Desperation? I just got it, and I'm diving in, and I've been waiting forever. I've seen you tweeting about it. I'm like, come on, Doug, put out this book so I can dive in, and finally I can. So tell people about your book. Um, it is a chronological schematic history of NFL, 
pro football strategy from 1920 to the present. Even you saying uh, that just makes me happy, Doug. From the T formation to the RPO. <laughs> and the the title kind of presupposes the basic theory of the book, which is that no innovation in professional football has ever come about through anything other than competitive desperation. Hmm. Uh, we, we as a team, we, you know, I as a player, we as a unit, are not good enough to beat the opponent we have just on you know our traditional scheme and execution we have to come up with something outside the box and that's you know the T formation stuff that the Bears put in in, in the uh, late 30s to Bill Walsh inventing the West Coast offense with the Bengals in 1969 because his, his starting quarterback got hurt to the Wildcat to I mean genius of desperation when Carson Wentz went down in week 13 the Eagles won the Super Bowl with a very limited backup quarterback in Nick Foles because they tripled their RPO package because they knew from his time with Chip Kelly that was the one thing he could handle consistently. So they still had coaches on the staff from the Kelly era, and they just brought them into the playbook. And Doug Peterson was not so arrogant to think, oh, I have to do it my way. He adapted, and that's really what the book is about. Well, Doug, I'm looking forward to reading it myself. I suggest anybody who loves football to dive in as well. And thanks for all the time here, Doug. Oh, thanks so much. Love you guys. Love your work, and uh, I'll keep reading. I really appreciate that. And then the same, no matter where you go, we will find you, Doug, at which national outlet. So appreciate it. And uh, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll talk a little Arizona. And make sure, again, that you follow Doug Farrar. And the book is The Genius of Desperation. Lucky's 13 Pubs has you covered for the best game day experience this football season. Tons of TVs, legendary appetizers, amazing fresh half-pound burgers, handcrafted sandwiches, and a wide variety of other pub favorites. The drink menu is awesome, too. Huge selection of tap beer, handcrafted cocktails, and the best Bloody Marys in town. Seriously, these bloodies are awesome. Try the Bacon Bloody, the Jalapeno Bloody, the Mother Mary, or just get a flight and try them all. Plus, Lucky's 13 celebrates Sunday Fun Day, happy hour all day long long on Sunday every Sunday. Events and prize giveaways during games too. Lucky's 13 has locations in Bloomington, Burnsville, Mendota, Plymouth, and Roseville. Having people over for the game? Call ahead to Lucky's and order some of those legendary apps and they'll be ready to bring home when you get there. It's football time at Lucky's 13 Pubs. Find them online at Lucky's13Pub.com. Lucky's13Pub.com. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Football time. And Lucky's 13 Pubs has you covered for the best game day experience. Lucky's13Pub.com. And that was just a one-time thing, and you shouldn't be concerned about Arizona. The latter, but I also think that with this Buffalo game, a point that Manny brought up earlier about how it's never going to go away, this this is something that's always going to be sitting in the back of their minds. And I guess it's good because it kind of lights that fire that, you know, whether it's you know being underprepared or not taking an opponent as, as seriously as you should, um, that should probably remain with them the rest of the year. But I think that... If I'm looking at this Arizona team and just seeing, I mean, what, Josh Rosen was 10 of 25 last week. I mean, he still had that, what, 75-yard touchdown. Yeah, it's yeah. impressive. But this team shouldn't, realistically, it shouldn't scare the Vikings. But, I mean, of course, they're, they're, the Buffalo game is not that distant of a memory. It was only three weeks ago. If it weren't Josh Rosen starting and it was Sam Bradford still, I think you would say... They're just going to kill Sam Bradford. Like, like, he can't run anymore. Not that he could ever really run to begin with, but he really can't run now. And he doesn't look even anything close to the 2016 quarterback that the Vikings had. But with Rosen, he's a bit of a wild card. We don't know uh, really his capabilities. I and mean, he's got a great arm, and he's got great footwork, and he's a rookie, so it's going to be tough. But with the rookies this year, we've seen them all have surprising good games and bad games. I think Josh Allen threw for 82 yards. Yeah, he was really bad <laughs> right. last week. And, and Sam Darnold lit it up against uh, Detroit in week one and then also has had some really tough games at times. And I would expect the same thing from Rosen. But when I look at you know this team and, and where they stand, Arizona, I mean, they're 31st in points per game. Yeah. How about an NFL team averaging 13 points a game these days? Especially with the the amount of offense that's that's out there. They average 221 yards per game total. Yeah. Yards. Stop it. Seriously? Not, yeah, not like passing yards, but just yards. So they're 31st in pass yards, 32nd in rushing yards. And, 
A team that's worse than the Vikings at running the ball. Yes, they are one of the uh, only two teams that are even worse. So this is an offense that has had almost no success whatsoever, and that's really tough for me to see them beating a little bit more confident Vikings team. And here's the other thing. Buffalo's offensive line actually did a decent job in that game. Arizona's offensive line is worse than the Vikings, and it's by a lot. And I think this is their chance to finally get the run going. I mean, as we talked about yep. with Doug, that you don't necessarily need to have an effective a top 10 run game to make the Super Bowl. But Arizona's run game ranks 31st, I believe, overall, and they just get, have gotten gashed throughout the first few weeks. You know, if Dalvin Cook can come back healthy off the hamstring he, he, sitting after sitting out another week, I think this is their chance to get as creative, if not more, um, and kind of using that strategy. I mean, we saw it. It was marginal to just in terms of the yard outputage, out, yardage output. Sure, no, wow. outputage is Out- totally right. <laughs> I just created my own word. We'll use it. We'll use um, it. It's going to be a good one. Um, this is their chance to finally see if they can generate the run because, you know, we don't know about Jets are up and down. I mean, then the Saints come into town and they've got a pretty good defense. Um, this is a good chance for them to see what they can get out of it or if they really, as, you, as we've talked about, need to kind of stray away from that going forward. And, so, they've, and they've already used their bad loss card. Yeah. They've already cashed <laughs> You don't in get their more than one card. of those. Yeah, you, you already year. used that with Buffalo and now you can't, you got to take care of business against the, the Cardinals and the Jets. And if this is another bad loss, it turns into 2016 all over again, mm-hmm. where you had the Philly loss when they weren't that good, and then the Chicago one that was a complete mess. And you, as the Vikings, cannot afford this because going forward here, you've got some really, really good quarterbacks that you're going to have to slow down at some point. And uh, if you can't slow down the 32nd offense that averages 221 yards a game, then I'm going to have a really <laughs> tough time believing in you going forward. I mean, this it's it's not like we feel like uh, the Eagles was a defining game for the season and a turning point type win, but it could be a turning point type loss if they somehow let this one get away from them. And it brings us back to week to week league. That, that yeah. I mean, that's just the way that it goes because now you're starting, you're in the second quarter of your season now. If you're viewing it four games at a time and then within that week to week, you have a pretty big opportunity here to come out at least at three and one. Very, very quickly before we before we get out of here. What do you tell me, Manny, that we've got to go to break? <laughs> We gotta let some baseball. So we like got we pa- got playoff baseball, baseball coming up. Passive here. aggressive producer. We got uh, we got Yankees <laughs> and Red Sox. It's going to take about six hours to get done tonight. Um, where are we at with the linebackers right now? Because Eric Kendricks was so good last year, mm-hmm. and this year it's like he's been bad in some spots and other. Other spots, he's just been very, very blah. And with Anthony Barr, teams taking yeah. advantage of him. But I, I would say if there is a turning point game for them, it's possibly what happened in Philadelphia. I'm going to have to look specifically closer at their games, but I thought they were both good. I mean, mm. Barr playing a role in shutting down a third and short play uh, along with Daniil Hunter, Eric Hendricks forcing a fumble. Right. It did not seem like the middle of the field was as wide open as it has been. But another thing, though, it's very hard to tell. Because Philadelphia didn't run the same stuff that Buffalo and Los Angeles did to have success and have those big plays. No, there was no very little misdirection. We talked about this. So weird. I, I, I thought that they were going to take a lot of pages out of the Rams book, and they didn't, and they didn't take advantage of the linebackers really at all. So I think that that's very much to be determined. Um, also to be determined is what will happen in the baseball, which is coming up next. <laughs> we have a baseball contest. On Yankees our, Red Sox game four on our airwaves. So enjoy uh, all six hours of that, as Manny said, and make sure again that you subscribe to the Purple Podcast, where you can hear more of us talking Minnesota Vikings football. Thank you all for listening and participating. Progressive presents Get Pumped, inspiration to help you do insurance stuff. Okay, time out. You're going to let your budget be the boss of you? Take control with Progressive's Name Your Price tool. Tell us what you want to pay for car insurance, and we'll help you find options that fit your budget. Here's some music to get you pumped. da dong da dong da dong da dong dang dang I hear your budget laughing at you. Oh, wait, that's just those kids laughing at me. Ignore them! Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. 
Storm prep. I'm Ed Donahue with an AP News Minute. The Panhandle and Big Bend will likely see winds in excess of 110 miles per hour. That's the warning from Florida Governor Rick Scott. Hurricane Michael is gaining strength in the Gulf of Mexico. People along the Florida Panhandle and in the Alabama Gulf Coast aren't preparing. Jeff Bayard with FEMA says the time to evacuate and heed the warnings is now. Hurricane Michael is going to be a devastating storm uh, to a part of Florida that has not seen a storm of this magnitude in quite some time. Nikki Haley is resigning as United Nations ambassador. She told me probably six months ago, she said, you know, maybe at the end of the year, at the end of a two-year period, but at the end of the year, I want to take a little time off. I want to take a little break. President Trump was with Haley in the Oval Office. She said she and the president together had solved a lot of problems. Now the United States is respected. Countries may not like what we do, but they respect what we do. They know that if we say we're going to do something, we follow it through, and the president proved that. I'm Ed Donahue.